For the people in the back. They were saying, oh, it's a Baptist sermon today. Yeah. <laughs> so, now, we, uh, the whole idea of this phrase comes, that idea, say it louder for the people in the back. It's basically when you come to a place in the old time, we would have said amen. In other words, we agree and we wish everybody else heard you. And as we go through culture, and man, we were sitting there talking this week going, this sermon couldn't have landed at any better time than where we are currently as a culture. You say, what sermon? We're going to talk, James has five chapters, the book of James. If you don't know who James is, he's Jesus' little brother. If you don't think that was a pressure situation growing up, you never had an overachieving sibling, okay? Um, but James is Jesus' little brother, and, and so later on in James' life, he receives Christ, accepts Jesus Christ and his mission and his plan and the way, and so he writes this book of James. Now, James, you can tell, is not a very educated writer. He's, he's not like a Paul who's very eloquent and very put together in his structure. James kind of is, uh, he's a grip it and riff it kind of dude, Okay. Because once he dives in, you can almost see in each chapter, he does a little call back here and then he'll go, oh, remember when I said that over here, but there's one chapter for every day of the week. So for what I'm going to challenge you to do for the next five Sundays, okay, I'm going to preach in chapter one today, chapter two next week, chapter three and so on. But each week, what I'd like you to do for your devotion is on Monday morning, I want you to read chapter one on cha Tuesday, chapter two. And that way, you're going to read the book of James five times by the end of this series, and it's only going to take you probably about an hour and a half combined over the five weeks. I'm not asking for a ton of your time. I'm asking for your investment in the word. Okay? And we'll see through today's passage how critical that is, the word is. So when we say louder for the people in the back, how many of you love being a Christian? Say amen. amen. How many of you have been embarrassed by how some Christians act? Say amen. amen. Isn't that awful? I'll be honest with you, I've been, this is the 8.30, you're my people. If you're a guest here this morning, welcome. Uh, I, it's been incredibly hard the last several weeks to watch the response. Well, let me, I'm going to change that. Response is not the right word. The reaction of the American church. Okay. I don't disagree, please don't misunderstand I'm excited for some of the things that have happened in our country. Uh, just because of the way I, I view scripture and what it means to my life, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to the decisions that have been made. I am extremely opposed to the reactions that were had by the church. I'll give it to you this way as an example. If you're wondering, I'll just be blunt, the, the whole Roe versus Wade overturning. Now, Part of the room may want to cheer that and celebrate from now until eternity because that was overturned. If so, great. I have no problem with that. Part of you may go, I have a ton of questions, and I don't know really where I stand on that. And Pastor Vince, isn't this where the church and the state are supposed to separate? Let me just walk through this for a second, so I'm asking you to give me some space before we get into the sermon. How many of you have ever lost a kid in the store? Okay, that's pretty intense. And you lose a kid, especially when you hit that tipping point, right? When you hit that tipping point and you go, I really can't find them. Your heart rate starts to go up. Panic starts to set in. Um, when you find the child, come here, Mojica. You're a much bigger child than I would typically lose in Walmart, okay? <laughs> For those of you that don't know, I have six kids, so I'm very experienced at losing children in Walmart. <laughs> but when the child is found, there is more of this that happens. And we hang on. What I saw the last couple weeks from the church was not an embracing and going, how, how do we go forward from here like this? Because that which was lost is found. What I saw from the American church was a lot of this. We won. Yes, we won. And let me, let me go online and tell everybody we won. 
I didn't embrace the broken. I high-fived what I saw as the other winners. You realize sometimes we forget this, that in our current culture, if Jesus would have went to the cross and died for us, in today's culture, we would have viewed it as a loss for our side. We didn't win, I guess we didn't win. Didn't win that one, I guess we'll hang around and wait for the next victory. Thank you. And so I've, I've been wrestling with this series because this series literally has been planned since November of last year. No way we could have known the timing of it. So I say thanks be to God for his providence and lining things up. Then I have to walk through it and go, okay, Lord. Sometimes preachers get this way where we start kind of wringing our hands because we go, ha <laughs> for the next five weeks, George, I'm going to light them up. I'm going to burn the building down, just set it on fire, you know. And then I realize that's a reaction, not a response. You know the difference, right? A reaction goes from brain to action. Or maybe heart to action, things we're passionate about. It doesn't actually filter through the brain. A response, something that hits our passion, filters through the brain, and then we put hands to it. Okay? How many of you have ever reacted on your kids? Yeah. You said something like, sit down, get over here. And your kids don't know what to do because you told them to sit down and move. But that's because you reacted, you didn't respond. You know, I will tear your arm off and beat you with it. You're probably not going to do that. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know all of you, so I'm going <laughs> to hold back on any judgment there. But I pray that over the next five weeks, here's what I pray. I pray that over the next five weeks, we as the house, we as Jesus Christ family, those that claim to be, call ourselves Christians, believers, Christ followers, I pray that over the next five weeks, we would listen to the words of James and has, how he instructs us to live our lives as believers, how he instructs us to walk this way as a Christian. And so if we'll dive into that, we're going to be in James chapter one today, and we're not going to go very far from there. I think I have one other reference scripture that's not in James chapter one, and we're just going to live there towards the end of James chapter one. There's a ton of stuff. Count it all joy, my brethren. He says, count it all joy when you fall into these temptations and these trials that come into your life. And we go, (laughs) count it all joy. What are you talking about, James? James. Did you bump your head? You spend too much time watching Jesus walk on water. We don't, it's not joyful to be in trial and temptation. He says, for that trial will work your patience or your steadfastness. And in your steadfastness, you will find wisdom. My brothers, count it all joy. My sisters, count it all joy when it doesn't go your way. Seems odd, right, culturally for us to say that out loud and go, that makes perfect sense. It doesn't make perfect sense. But what Jesus did didn't make perfect sense. Even to the Jewish people at the time, those he was coming to save, it didn't make sense. They wanted him to roll in kind of like we do. We want this big, big, come on Jesus, big white horse, armored up, ready to fight. Let's overthrow this Roman government. And Jesus comes in meek and lowly, riding on the, the donkey as he enters the gates. And like a lamb led to slaughter, he opened not his mouth, and won the greatest victory in the history of the world. That just doesn't, man, it's hard for us to do this when that's the victory. And we as a people, myself included, I like to brag, I'm a little, I have my moments of arrogance. How many of you have moments of arrogance? Say amen. Okay, so I'm not gonna, I, I'm confessing that. How many of you know God humbles you in your moments of arrogance? This week, I was picking up my daughter from the daycare, and uh, I had a four by eight sheet of pegboard hanging out the back of my truck. I put Bren in her car seat, ran around the back of the truck, grabbed my phone just like this, just as I made the turn around the bed of my truck, looked up, boom, cut my forehead, my glasses cut my face, I'm laying in open arms daycare, bleeding in the parking lot. 
And then there's this young couple that were walking. They're doing their afternoon exercise, which maybe God was telling me I should have been doing more of that. They walk by, and the guy goes, Oh! Oh! Are you okay? And I said, I got up, and I put my hand on my head, and I was like this, and I moved my hand, and I was bleeding all over the place. And he said, Are you okay, sir? And I said, Yeah, I think I'm good. And then he went, Okay. <laughs> and he started laughing then. And I could appreciate that because I, I can only imagine what it looked like. God will humble you. He, he slowed me down in that moment. You can get, and I'm going to show you another moment he can slow us down too in just a second. But I, I want to dive into this passage at the end of James, starting in chapter ni- or verse 19 of chapter 1 of James. We have this story where James is going, hey, I, I just think people need just a, a, a reference guide. Where do we go back to to know how to act and live as a Christian? And so verse 19, he starts with the phrase, know, know this, know this, my brothers, know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, and that includes on your keyboard, and slow to anger. I can probably rest on that passage for a while. But you can't stop here without going at least to verse 20, because in verse 20, he explains it, that the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Let me tell you something so often, and I've heard preachers preach this, where we say things like, well, it was righteous anger, so I have a reason. The only time Jesus flipped the tables when people were making a mockery of the house. That's it. It wasn't when he saw horrible things going on in the world around him. It was when they disrespected the house and the house of God. That was when he flipped the tables. You have made this place a den of thieves. In any other system, any other moment, we see Jesus showing mercy, compassion, and walking with people. And we go, well, I got a right to be mad. Those things are against God. I don't know if you know or not, but we live in a world that's broken and sinful. So most of what you're going to see is against God. The righteousness of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, because of this, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. I'm going to just stop right there. This is the first part of this passage. He said, instead of acting out, speaking out, yelling out, complaining out, griping out, moaning out, crying, all, instead of doing all that, go to the word. Go to the word of God and put it more and more and more in you so that when the time is right, God will be able to pull it out of you. He will be able to call that to your mind when you need it. Instead of there being an emotional response, there's a biblical response. And that's where we struggle because that means we got to kind of we got to kind of lean into something that at times feels archaic. It feels old. And, and the reality is the word of God is still the word of God. And it's still filled with truth. And I still believe that no matter the problem, struggle, system, trial, that the word of God has the answer to get you through it. I believe that. Now, what I also believe is we spend a lot of time Viewing it from our perspective rather than asking God to give it to us from his perspective. God, what do you want me to say about this? And he goes on in verse 26. I'm going to jump because here's what Jesus is doing in verse 19 through 21. And then he does it from 26 and 27. He's setting up a contrast between worldly living and godly living. Following the world or following God. In the first part he says, be, be slow to speak, quick to hear slow to anger for the righteousness or for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, don't live wicked. Don't be involved in the rampant sin of the word or world. Instead, with meekness, receive the word of God. This is the, the, the juxtaposition, so to speak, of what God is saying. This is how the world lives. This is how you ought to live. But then in verse 26, he kind of leans in and he says, now, this is the way that you live this godly life. Verse 22. 
but be doers of the word and not hearers only or you deceive yourself. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer of the word, he's like a man who looks at his identity, at his natural face in a mirror. And for he looks at himself and then he goes away and at once he forgets what he was like. But the one who looks in, into the perfect law, who looks into the perfect law, I'm going to come back to that in a second, the law of freedom or liberty and perseveres, sticks to it, being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be what, church? Blessed. In his hearing? No, in his doing. I'm glad a lot of people like I enjoy preaching. It's one of my favorite things to do. You guys have heard me say this. You've heard me testify this. It's my, one of my favorite things to do. But if I preach a sermon on Sunday and you act if it didn't exist on Tuesday, I just wasted air. It's not about you hearing the word. It's about you doing what it is you heard and actually living this thing out, living it in a way that makes sense, not to the world, but to God and to his word. If you'll live it out like that, then the world will begin to take notice and go, this seems odd. This doesn't make sense. And that's, that's what the original church did. They lived in a way that confused the governments around them. They lived in a way that confused the worlds around them. They said, no, 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 higher education isn't just, this is the reality. The church started higher education. This is a reality. The church started hospitals. This is a reality. The church started orphanages. This, those realities are true. And the reason the world stopped and looked is because they said, that doesn't make sense. Why would you waste time on something that's been thrown away? Why would you waste time on something that's sick? Why would you waste time on educating people? Why would you waste time on that? And the church said, because there's a bigger plan at play. There's a bigger purpose than you see. And so the church said, okay, here we're going to be doers of the word and not hearers only. You want, don't want to be this, like this person who looks at a mirror and then walks away. You want to be blessed in all that you are doing. God's word is intended to change us, church. It's not to entertain us, even though there's some great stories in there. I love the Bible. It's my favorite, it's my favorite book, and I love to read. I read it all. I read fiction. I read autobiographies. I read leadership books. I, I just love to read. But the Bible, man, it's got it all. You want comedy? Read the part where the donkey talks to Balaam. That's pretty funny stuff right there. Or the part where David goes and acts like a wild man in front of the Philistines so they don't kill him. You can read some crazy stuff about the guy who got stabbed in the belly, but he was so large that the sword disappeared so they didn't know how he died. <laughs> People are like, what? It's in there. You want a love story, read Solomon, but don't read it with your kids. It's a little racy. Right? You can also read about Jacob and his pursuit of his wife. Action, man, start in Samuel, read through Kings, and it's all there. You want a dramatic story? Start with the life of Paul and his redemption after standing on the side of the stoning pit holding the coats as they killed Christians and he became the voice to the Gentiles, which ultimately gave you and I an opportunity for salvation. It's all there, but you got to fall in love with the word of God. You got to fall in love with the word of God so that you can be a doer of the word of God. So here's, here's, I'm going to walk through this. This key to living out your faith is just that, that we got to understand that the word of God was intended to change us, not entertain us. It is not just for consumption, but it is for our construction. It is what builds us the word of God. It's not just me taking it in so I can sit around and rip off verses to impress people. No, 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 no. So funny, one time I was at a, a family member's house and we walked in and it's, I get tickled sometimes when you get, so what do you do? I'm a preacher. Oh, I'm like, here we go. And then and what's so funny isn't the questions they ask me, it's the justification they want to give themselves. I went, I went to vacation Bible school a lot when I was a kid. I'm like, that's awesome. I know the books of the Bible. <laughs> Good. It's great. You may say them for you. It's been a while, but I think I could do it. I'm like, I don't need you to do this. 
I don't need you to say the books of the Bible. It's okay. No, it's okay. I'll say them for you. <sighs> then they sing the song. How many of you remember the song? Yeah, some of you are like, yes, I remember the song. Some of you are like, what song? It's okay. You were abused as a child if you weren't taught the uh, books of the Bible song. <laughs> but you was at Genesis, Exodus, Genesis, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judge, Ruth, 1st, 2nd, Samuel, 1st, 2nd, Kings. First. And they would start running through them. And I'm like, man, they get through the whole Old Testament. I'm like, that's awesome. Do you know what Obadiah is about? <laughs> you can almost hear the gears lock up. No, no. I'm like, that's a great story. You should check into it. It's really short. It's not that. It wouldn't take you half. Wouldn't take you really thirty minutes to read it. That's where it is. Here's the thing. We we have been convinced that because we sit in a house, we're following. And just because we sit in a house doesn't mean we follow. And this James steps out and goes, "You need to follow." Don't just hear the word, do the word. Don't just, don't just allow it to come in and impact you on a Sunday morning, but allow it to go from your heart to your mind to your hands into a world that desperately needs it, to your friends that desperately need it, to your neighbors and your coworkers that desperately need the word of God. Don't, don't get all shiny on Sunday and then forget who you are on Monday. That, that's not benefiting the kingdom. In fact, I would say that's what's got us in the news, church. It's because we, we like the shiny part, but the reality is this. I said this to the Reach Center volunteers one night. I said, here's the reality, is that there is going to come a moment when conviction runs crossways to your convenience. And you will have to make a choice whether you're going to stay in a convenient place or move through a convicted place. I'm going to tell you, it's not easy. And you will lose friendships. People that you know and love will not continue to walk with you. You're going to be seen as a bigot. You're going to be seen as somebody that's too fanatical. And I'm not even talking the extreme stuff. I'm just saying... Live by the word and see what happens. Watch what happens. The Bible is truth. So the first thing he says, we have to listen. You have to, if you got to be in a place to hear, but you got to listen when you're there. This idea of listening is this. We're not capable of producing righteousness of God apart from God. Our only hope is in him working in us through the power of the Holy Spirit. I don't get to do Jesus or be like Jesus without the power of Jesus living in me. I'm flawed. And so as we walk through that, instead, I, I, I don't want to be like this. Now, I said earlier I'm a little arrogant, so I'm, I'm about to reveal something to some of you that have never seen it. I usually, when I leave the house, let me just be honest with you. George, when I leave the house, when I leave the house, I usually feel pretty good about how I'm put together. It matters to me that my clothes match. Okay? It didn't matter to me until Aaron came on staff that my shoes were cool. Now it matters. <laughs> trying to relate. <clears throat> but I'm usually, I'm usually put together. And I've been that way since I can remember. Like, even when I was little, I knew there were certain things you didn't do, certain things you didn't wear with certain things. Okay? You don't wear blue and black together. Just a thing. I just, I don't know why. I, I, I knew it innately. It was like God gifted me. I don't know if that's what it was. But I've always, when I leave, I'm always pretty get put together. I never, ever had a moment where I was like, oh, school pictures are coming out. What well, that's going to be like until. How many of you have that school picture? You know what I mean. That school picture. The one you're like, please, God, help me bury this in existence so that no one ever sees. Well, I'm going to show you mine. Okay. Yeah, I had hair, George, thanks. Thanks. It's fifth grade. It would have been weird if I didn't, okay? When I left this morning, I felt pretty good about myself. I was rocking the sweater vest, the blue plaid underneath. It was working, had a lot of hair, and it had, I had a part going on one side. But this, by this age, mom wasn't helping me get dressed. And you're, some of you are like, obviously. No, I look, I look good when I left. And I went into the picture moment like I was owning it. And then when the pictures came out, I still didn't know anything different. It wasn't until my teacher, Miss Hoover, I remember it. 
Miss Hoover was handing out class pictures. And you remember the old school class pictures where they put the biggest one right in the front with the see-through thing? Like, so when, that's, she was, Jimmy, Susan, Laura. <laughs> Vince. Vince, come here. I'm like, okay. So I walk up there and she hands it to me and I thought, oh my gosh. In fifth grade, I said, oh my gosh. If it had been much older, I would have said other things. And I got home and my mom saw those pictures. And she, <laughs> this is why my, I miss my mom so much. She said, well, it's not the worst one I've seen. <laughs> so you sure? <laughs> she said, no, but I don't think it's the worst one I've seen. Here's the thing. When I left that morning, I looked in the mirror and everything was good. Hair was right. Shirt was right. Everything was good. But I didn't check throughout the day. When the time came to take the picture, stuff was off. You tracking with me? So here's the thing, church. Every morning you're going to leave your house. And I pray you take a good look in the word at who you are. The struggle is throughout your day, you don't know when they're going to take the picture. And if stuff isn't right, it's not the morning you, it's the picture they have and go, this is what a Christian looks like. This is what a follower of God looks like. I saw it. Yeah, I know the lady at Walmart was struggling and it was, nothing was going right, but this person lost their stuff. So if that's what it is, I don't need it. Yeah, I've seen them online. They took the picture while you were posting your opinion. Please, you can be offended by this or not. Does it matter at all? Social media opinions, you understand that, right? Social media opinions don't matter at all. Literally, it's a push of a button and the whole thing goes away. You don't get control of the button, which that frustrates us. But ultimately, it's one push of a button somewhere in California, and the whole thing goes away. That's how much that matters in the end of the day. Other than the picture you leave while you're there. Somehow that lasts forever. So you have to listen. But when in listening, it's not just hearing it. It is listening it and depositing it into your heart to go, God, I want to make sure that I'm following who you are. I want to make sure that I'm doing what you say. I don't want to walk in front of the mirror, see myself, and then be somebody else different when I leave the house. So I have to listen. Next, you have to follow. Here's the thing about living according to the word of God. Church, it's not optional. It's not optional. I love Jesus, I just don't like his rules. Not a thing. Do you know that's not possible? Yeah, no, it is. I love Jesus' teaching. I just don't like that he tells me what to do all the time. Then you don't love Jesus. Yeah, I I love Jesus, but some of the stuff, Vince, no, listen, it's not my, I'm not telling you that because I get the authority to. The word of God says that. But God, they do not accept what God says to do then they have not accepted God. John 14, 15. If you love me, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. John 14, 15. You don't have to take my word for it. It's in your Bible too. Follow. That's why in the Psalm, Psalms 119, 11, that's why this is so important. He says, I have stored your word in my heart Man, that's really beautiful. And we could just leave it there, except that's not the end of the verse. I, could, I have stored your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. Do you hear the do on the other end of the hearing? I've, I've listened to your word, but why, God? Why is it important for me to listen to your word? So I don't sin against you. Why? Because I love you and therefore I want to keep your commandment. That's how this works. So I listen, I follow, and some of us, listen, all of us are getting this right sometimes. Can I get an amen on that? We're we're killing this sometimes. The struggle is the remaining part, is the staying. 
Listen to what he says as we continue. James, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test. This is why people don't like the book of James. You can leave that up now. The book of James is full of if and then conditions. And what we really love about some of the teaching we've received is that so long as we said a prayer in vacation Bible school, we're good. And James kind of takes that thought process and goes, no, you're not. And then first John follows it and says, listen, Christian, you may need to repent also. In fact, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is Lord, then you shall be saved. We know that. But John tells us that if we confess, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. The difference in those two passages is one is written to a lost person and first John is written to us, the church. And he says, confess so that you can be clean. Confess so that you can, it can be wiped away. You have to, we, we want to remain for when he has stood the test when he has stood the test, he will receive when and then condition. When you remain and you stood the test, then you will receive this crown of life. It's not easy. Simple, but not easy. God gave us a book that's been around for years to give us the how. It's simple to follow instructions. Most of us know how. Only thing typically that stands in the way of us following instructions is our pride. And we all got some. We all got some. So we remain. True follower of God does what God says, not only when it's easy, but also when it's hard. Believing God, responding to him in faith. Church, I want us to be, and and this is just an overview of where we're going the next couple weeks. We're going to lean into, I think I'm going to do a sermon called Zip It. Because in one of the books of James, he talks a whole lot about our mouth. Anybody struggle with their mouth occasionally? He talks about our racism and bigotry and all those things in the book of James. He said five chapters, he just piled it on. So get your head right, church. Get your heart right, church. Then your hands will be right. I think we've just mixed it up some. I still love the church. Don't hear me wrong, please. This is the greatest place ever. It's the greatest thing that God has ever asked me to do is be a pastor to the local church. It's the only thing I ever want to do. One of the things that comes along with shepherding is looking into the word and going, God, where do we need to get lined back up? Where do we need to come back to center? And so I'm praying that we say it louder for the people in the back. We say it louder for the people in the community. We say it louder for the people that don't know that this is Jesus and this is what it's like to be a follower of Jesus.